So Imam al-Ghazali has his own taxonomy of the Quranic verses and sciences in Jawahar al-Quran. And that's why the books we're studying because he's really giving you his methodology. And even though that you'll find some of the ulama disagreed with him, overall it's been accepted by the ummah. This was considered a, a, a very important book historically. So he talks about the six types of Quranic verses. The first one, is it deals with the knowledge of Allah's attributes and his work. So th these are what he calls the jewels. The second is the knowledge of the straight path, sirat al-mustaqim. In other words, how do we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to knowledge of God and to his pleasure. And these he calls pearls. Now one of the reasons that he does this is that jewels and pearls, you don't find them on the street. Uh, jewels, you have to mine for them uh, in the mountains. Pearls you have to dive into the ocean to get. So he's, he's really letting us know that these are things that we have to struggle for. They're, they, they're, they're not simply, I mean, one of the, uh, in the gospel, it says, don't cast pearls to swine. In other words, don't give something precious to something unworthy of it. And this is why an, it's important to remember that Imam al-Ghazali sees everything in the world as a having a, a, a hidden meanings. So he would see jewels and pearls, the physical ones that people hold precious and will actually kill to obtain. That, that these have spiritual significances. So he's using them in that spiritual sense, the jewels and the pearls. And then people's condition on meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's different ahwal, fariqun fil jannah wa fariqun fil sa'ir. Allah says one group's in paradise, another group's in hell. And we don't know our condition with Allah. We hope that we're from the Najun, the people of Najat, the people of salvation, but only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those conditions. Um, and then the conditions of believers and unbelievers. In, if you look, you can see the people here, their conditions. What Allah says that the, the believers have, who are they? They're people that they're, they're present in their prayer. They give out from what they've uh, been given. They have qualities. So he's saying that the Quran will give us these indications uh, here. And then also arguments of the kafirun and uh, the rudud. So arguments against people that deny the Quran, that attack the Quran. There's arguments in the Quran. One of the things that uh, the Quran does almost immediately is it gives a taxonomy of the three types of human beings. So there's believers, there's disbelievers, and then there's hypocrites. So already it's telling you, you're going to be in one of those three categories, not a fourth category. And then the six are the stages of the path to God and how to prepare for it. So these are all really related and the knowledge of the straight path, you're going to find them uh, in these others. And one of the things that he says is that there are verses in the, uh, in the Quran that will contain more than one. He will always look in order to determine which category it goes into. He will look what is the most important element. So if it's a jewel, Despite the fact that it has other aspects in the verse, he'll always put it with the jewels. If it's a pearl, despite the fact that it has other uh, types in it, he'll put it with the pearls. So this is his methodology. And then he has the science, the, the 10 sciences. So one is he calls the pith, which is the lub. What's at the essence of it? So knowledge of God in the last day, knowledge of the straight path, fiqh and kalam. And these, this is the order. So he considers uh, the knowledge of Allah on the last day is, all, is going to go under, obviously, kalam will be knowledge of Allah on the last day and, and of the Prophet. But kalam is the, the science that emerges out of it, just like fiqh is the science that emerges out of the knowledge of the straight path. So these are sciences that develop later. So the Quran has the usul of these things in them, but the furu' were brought out by the scholars over time. And this takes about 300 years before they're really solidified. And then you see a, a continual development, but overall within the first 300 years, you see uh, the solidification. And then also there's wow, and there's qasas, there's preaching, and there's story uh, telling. So these are the, at the essence of the Quran, and then he has what he calls the shell, which protects it. 
So one is the exoteric uh, exegesis, which means tafsir, of just what it means outwardly. And then also the Arabic language, because you need Arabic to understand the Quran. Uh, we sent it down as a Arabic Quran. So it is in Arabic. And although we use translations, translations were really debated for, for a long time. In fact, when uh, Marmaduke Pikthal, Muhammad Marmaduke Pikthal, went to Al Azhar to get permission to translate the Quran, a lot of the scholars didn't want to give it because they did not, they, they actually were opposed to translations. Traditionally, the earliest translations come out of Persia where you got interlinear notes. So they helped uh, Persians to understand the Quran. But generally, the, 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 the ulama were of the opinion that the Quran cannot be translated, that it's an untranslatable work. And this is why uh, Al-Azhar actually, as a prerequisite for giving any seal of approval, that it's an interpretation or the meanings of the Quran that it's not the Qur'an. And in fact, I thought it was interesting that uh, Dr. Bruce Lawrence, who wrote this very interesting biography of the history of the Qur'an in English, he actually says that he prefers to leave Qur'an, K-O-R-A-N, in English to mean the translation, and Al-Qur'an, which is now the new transliteration for it, to mean the, the Arabic Qur'an. So it's, it's very interesting, but when we say the Qur'an says and then we quote English, that's actually not really the Qur'an. Um, and inshallah there's something that the Arabs call majaz al hadf where you leave something at wasal al qariya ask the village, but it really means ahl al qariya It's like shahr ramadan Some of the ulama said you shouldn't say shahr ramadan You shouldn't say Ramadan without saying shahr ramadan because Ramadan was considered by some to be one of the names of Allah. So you don't say ja ramadan um, s these are, inshallah, Allah doesn't, inshallah, take people to account for um, these type of things, I think. There, there's, there's a generosity with our Lord, inshallah. But we do make mistakes, and um, especially when we're fasting. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping my brain is going to keep working, but um, the Arabic language is extremely important. Uh, and then Arabic grammar, because Arabic language is knowing, like the, the, the Sahaba knew the Arabic language, but they didn't know Arabic grammar. If you asked one of the Sahaba, what's the difference between mafa'ulun uh, bihi wa ism mafa'ul, he wouldn't know what it was. If you asked him what, Zaydun uh, Qa'imun, what's Zayd and what's Qa'im? He wouldn't know Mubtada and Khabar. He wouldn't know a Jumla Ismiya from a Jumla Fi'liya. But he would understand them. So it's, you can know Arabic, the Arabic language, without knowing Arabic grammar. Grammar uh, is, a, it can go on for a long time to actually really get deep into grammar. If you end up with Mullah Jami, for instance, which is the great Central Asian scholar, um, you're, you're in the philosophy of grammar. Uh, most of the ulama uh, now will do the Alfi of Ibn Malik, which traditionally was an intermediate grammar, but now it's considered an advanced grammar. Um, in Mauritania, the, the ulama tend to do the Ihmirar of Mukhtar al Buna after the Alfiya, and that's 3,000 additional lines of, of, of uh, the Alfiya is 1,000 lines of grammar. That's another 3,000 for all the things that the Alfiya doesn't deal with. So grammar is really important, and it's highly neglected. And one of the things that Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya says in his book on um, Amari al-Dalalat, which are actually Amali, in other words, he the book was just his lectures from, from his memory, and then they were transcribed. That's what, those are called Amali in our tradition. So there's a lot of Amali books where the ulama were just giving lectures and people would transcribe them. So uh, in, he says in Amali al Dalalat that the, and that it could be Dilalat is the way they say it in North Africa. It's one of those, it's called a Muthalath because it, it has all three, Dalala, Dulala, and Dilala in Arabic. But he says that there's a infikak. There was a separation of Arabic 
grammar from Sharia studies. So the, a lot of the students in the Sharia colleges, they learn grammar, but they don't learn it to the degree that's necessary to really navigate usul al-fiqh. Because a lot of usul al-fiqh deals with grammar and with uh, logha, with diction and things like that. And then you have to know the Quranic recensions. So the, these are also outwardly. So the recensions, there's 10 qiraats that are considered mutawatira. Um, seven are in the Shatabiyah from the great Andalusian scholar, Imam Shatabi, not the Sahib bin Muwafaqat, but the Qari, so, or the Muqri rather. So Imam Shatabi put all 10 of the qira, uh, seven of the qiraat, and then Imam al Jazari uh, did a versification of, of, of the seven. So if you learn the Shatabiyah and the Durra, which is traditionally what's studied to learn the 10 qiraat, um, then you basically know all the different recensions. And then obviously there's riwayat of those recensions, but these are not significant differences, but they, they do differ in their pronunciations of things. Um, not in the actual letters, the attributes, but in, in, in the mudud, uh, in things like hamza, in things like the taqlil or the imala, so uh, saying things like uh, or like, for instance, in, in Warsh, you have Tahi. It's the only time you'll have a little diamond under the Ha to let you know that it's, uh, it's, it's a Kasra. It goes to Kasra as opposed to between Kasra and uh, Fatha. So these, these are the recensions. And then you get into the Huruf, Usul al-Huruf and Furu' al-Huruf. Um, and people spend their whole life studying this. It's, it's pretty amazing that we have this. I mean, it is a miracle, the recensions themselves. And then you have points of articulation. This is really tajweed. So learning tajweed, the sifat al-huruf, the mustahaqq al-huruf, haqquhu wa mustahaqquhu. So it's what it's due and then what occurs to it, like idgham. So you have idgham bi ghunna, idgham bi ghayri ghunna, learning those things. These are the 10 sciences that he puts forward.